So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get started. It's our great pleasure to introduce and to welcome here in Prague, in Faculty of Arts, Professor Timothy Garten Esch, and to host his lecture titled From Post-War Europe to Post-Wall Europe and Back. Professor Timothy Garten Esch uh, works at the University of Oxford, European Studies. He is a uh, ISA Berlin Professional Fellow at St. Anthony's College in Oxford and Senior Fellow uh, at Hoover Institution in Stratford University. You probably know that he publishes a lot in, for instance, The Guardian, The Review of New York Books, and I should mention that he published many books on contemporary history, European contemporary history, to list some of them, for instance, free speech, free world, in name of Europe, Germany in divided uh, continent, the Polish Revolution, or the book which resonated most in the Czech Republic, The Magic Lantern, which was probably the first analysis of revolutionary processes in Eastern Europe, in East Germany, Poland, uh, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia probably the first key how to understand transition to democracy in Eastern, Eastern Europe. So we are, uh, we are looking forward to your lecture, but before we start, I should mention that this lovely event uh, is organized on occasion of Czech Presidency of uh, uh, Council of the EU and, uh, and under the patronage of Minister Mikuláš, Mikuláš Beck. Before I give the floor to Professor Timothy Garten Esch, I would like to I would like to ask uh, our Dean Eva Lehechkova for opening address. So please. Good morning, everyone from me as well, uh, Professor Esch, distinguished guests, uh, my dearest colleagues. Let me welcome you as well. Uh, for this event at the Faculty of Arts of Charles University. Uh, it is truly a great honor for us to host this event co-organized with the Office uh, of the Government of the Czech Republic uh, on the eve of the Velvet Revolution. Naturally, this upcoming lecture thus enters into the context of other events that uh, are held at our university these days. I'm referring specifically uh, to an ongoing university student strike for raising awareness of uh, the climate change and its impacts on humankind, not only environmentally, but also socially. One of the students' mottos that I particularly appreciate is remembering is not enough. This surely provokes a follow-up question, what is enough then? And how we, as an academic body, uh, can contribute to dealing with um, inevitable present and future challenges that our society will have to face. I believe that there is no better background for today's lecture by Professor Ash than this particular one, as the topic of his talk, albeit truly fascinating on its own, also offers an answer to the general question, what is our role and responsibility? The global pandemic, as well as the war in Ukraine, has shown once again to political representatives, to media, and to research grant providers uh, that uh, the contribution of humanities and social sciences in these respects uh, in order to navigate through the times of crisis successfully is a crucial one. Our disciplines including philosophy, history, archaeology, discourse studies, sociolinguistics um, comprise a vast amount of knowledge, maybe sometimes too vast to handle. It might seem impenetrable and incomprehensible incompre to outsiders or novices in, their, in these studies. And that's where 
the guidance of uh, scientists, of academics, uh, come into play. Uh, and I really believe that if we serve as academics open to discussions, open to suggestions, open to sharing experience, uh, that clues for coping with future challenges can be provided. One of the particular challenges that I have in mind in this context is the polarization of societies, which raises an obstacle in reaching consensus in, even in the core issues related to founding principles of democracy. I feel that to focus on these issues is one of the main responsibilities of humanities and social sciences. And that is why I also feel that there is no better place and time for Professor Ash to give his talk than this faculty on this very day. Professor Ash, welcome to the Faculty of Arts. Uh, thank you very much um, for those very kind introductions. It's a huge pleasure to be with you here uh, the day before the 17th of November, uh, which I remember vividly um, being having a ringside seat for the Velvet Revolution with Václav Havel in the Magic Lantern Theater in Prague in 1989 was one of the great experiences of my life. Um, and um, you started it, you the students. Um, remember that if you've forgotten. Uh, I vividly remember the, the, the students who were present as activists during the Velvet Revolution. At one point, a group of students came into the Magic Lantern Theater holding up little mirrors um, in which we were meant to, to look to make sure that we didn't become too arrogant and vain um, uh, um, as, 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 as the revolution progressed. And I was really glad to hear that this tradition of student activism continues with what the Dean just mentioned, students here being active on the issue of climate. Uh, it's great that you keep up this tradition of, of student activism at, at the Charles University and in Prague, um, which of course goes all the way from Jan Oplatal through Jan Palach, um, unforgotten to the Velvet Revolution and to today. But that was such a hopeful time. We speak as the largest war in Europe since 1945 has continued for close to nine months as Putin's Russia has just launched a state terrorist attack on Ukraine, 90 plus missiles targeted at the civilian population, and a missile we don't know exactly whose missile has actually landed on Polish territory. So we speak in very different times. And the theme of my lecture, which as you mentioned, is from post-war Europe to post-war Europe and back is to try and understand how we got to this place, how we got from that extremely hopeful moment of 1989 to this quite desperate moment that we're in today. What I'm going to give you in the next 40, 50 minutes is one thread of the interpretation in a new book that I've just completed, A Personal History of Contemporary Europe, called Homelands, A Personal History of Europe, which, by the way, is also coming out in Czech with Prostor sometime next year or the year after. And my book is in dialogue with a book that many of you will know, Tony Judd's history of, I can see one or two of you nodding, Tony Judd's history of Europe since from 1945 until the early 2000s. Tony Judd's book was called Post-War. I don't know what the title is in Czech. I don't know if it, maybe you use the same word. 
And this title, post-war, had actually two meanings. The obvious meaning was post-1945, since the Second World War, since the war. The less obvious meaning was after war. That is to say, it was the story of a Europe which set out after 1945 to be a continent of peace. Its motto, never again, um, were we going to see war on our continent. Now, the message that Europeans had decided suddenly to abhor and abjure war would have been surprising news to much of the rest of the world. Because let me remind you that European colonial powers for the next 30 years were fighting colonial wars to try to defend their colonial possessions, right? So actually on Victory in Europe Day, the French were suppressing an uprising in Algeria. The French fought a brutal war to defend their colonies in Algeria, the British in Malaya, in Kenya, all the way to the Portuguese colonies of Angola and Mozambique, which only gained their independence in the mid-1970s. That Europe was to be a continent without war would also have been news to people in Central and Eastern Europe, where, of course, armed conflict continued into the late 1940s, where you then had the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, as you all know, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, then in Poland in 1981, something that was called Stan Wojenny, literally a state of war. So that, and Václav Havel himself often emphasized in his essays from the 1970s and 80s, that Central and Eastern Europe, Europe behind the Iron Curtain, was not actually at peace in the sense that people in Western Europe were at peace. Now, the day after the Berlin Wall came down, I was walking down a street in East Berlin, and I encountered a very excited East Berliner, just been to the West for the first time in his life. And he told me that he'd just seen a handwritten poster an improvised poster which said, only today is the war really over, right? And there's an important sense in which for the whole of Central and Eastern Europe, the Europe that had been behind the Iron Curtain, including Czechoslovakia, the war only really ended in November 1989. Uh, it was the second year zero. And so Europe, in a deeper sense, only started to live up to its promise of never again, of being a continent that was really after war, and not just after the war, in the post-war period, i.e. the period after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this was true in two senses. Firstly, in an objective geopolitical sense. Um, the massive armed forces included nuclear forces that had been right in the center of Europe, withdrew. The peace settlement that we had not had in 1945 at the end of the Second World War, there was no formal peace settlement, actually happened in 1990, 1991, the treaties around German unification, the Charter of Paris for a New Europe, the um, German-Polish, German-Czechoslovak treaties, all of those actually were the peace settlement uh, that we had failed to have at the end of 1945. So in a sense, the Second World War and the Cold War ended together. And um, this continent started to move towards an era of peace. But there was also a subjective, generational element to this story. 
So one way of thinking about the history of Europe since 1945 is that the history of a, a few key political generations, right? So you have the 14ers, the generation shaped by the experience of the First World War, Churchill, de Gaulle, de Gasperi, Konrad Adenauer, Tomasz Garig Masaryk. You have the 39ers, the generation shaped by the experience of the Second World War, many of the founders of, 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 of post-war Europe, um, Helmut Schmidt, for example, Simone Weil, the French politician who survived both Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz, Bronisław Geremek, um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the great Polish dissident and foreign minister, and many others. The generation that became really influential in post-war Europe after 1989 was the 68ers, the 68ers, the 68ers. Very distinctive generation, anti-fascist, anti-imperialist, anti-war. And then you have the 89ers, some of them still in this room. The Minister for Europe, in a sense, I think is an 89er. Um, one or two others in this room I can see. That's to say, people who were shaped by the experience of 1989. Um, in the West, it would be people like Ivan Krastev, Anne Applebaum, Timothy Snyder. There's a whole generation of people who were shaped by that experience. Karl Mannheim, in an essay on political generations, says that people's formative political experience is often between the ages of 17 and 25. So you can maybe think what your formative experience was. We could talk about that in discussion. But in the post-war period, it was particularly the 68ers, uh, very strongly anti-war. And they seized this opportunity of a Europe at peace with both hands. Take the peace dividend, um, reduce our defense spending to well under the NATO target of 2% of GDP. Security was now going to be about collective security, non-military security, threats against non-state actors, threats from non-state actors, because there was never again going to be a major interstate war in Europe, was there? Surely not. It was about the primacy of economic policy, about globalization, about economic interdependence, which would strengthen peace. So it's fine to get more dependent on Russia for your energy because interdependence is good. And in a sense, we saw ourselves as a Europe that was moving towards Immanuel Kant's famous notion of perpetual peace, zum ewigen Frieden. This was going to be a Europe without walls and without war. And we forgot the old Russian proverb which says, perpetual peace lasts until the next war. And in a sense, what I want to argue is that underlying these illusions of the post-war period was a historiosophical mistake. The historiosophical mistake was to take what happened between 1989 and 1991 from the first changes in Poland and Hungary through the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Velvet Revolution all the way to the end of the Soviet Union and to persuade ourselves that this was the way history was going. This was the new normal. So we took history with a small h, the product of chance, what Machiavelli calls fortuna, of individual political choices, of political will, and turns it into history with a capital H, a Hegelian process of the inevitable progress towards the spread of freedom. Whereas in fact, what happened between 1989 and 1991 was a one in a million example of historical luck. It was anything but inevitable, anything but a process. 
So if you take what I call the upward turn in European history, which begins in the mid-1980s, roughly about 1985, and then reaches a high point in 1989, of course there were deep structural factors. For example, the fact that Soviet-type systems fail to make the transition from extensive economic growth based on heavy industry to intensive economic growth based on technology and services. Yes, there were deep structural factors. But if you look at the prehistory of 1989, it was actually the product of the confluence of four separate major developments, each of which had a strong component of historical luck and um, individual action. Number one, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. The 11th of March, 1985, if you want to date the date that Gorbachev emerges. But until quite um, some, some months before that date, it was entirely possible that another leader of the Soviet Union would have emerged, a man called Grigory Romanov, good name for a Russian leader, Romanov. Um, and then this entire history would have been completely different. There would have been no fall of the Berlin Wall, there would have been no Velvet Revolution, and there might still today be something that could be called a Soviet Union, and you, I'm afraid, might still be living in its sphere of influence, the sphere of influence that Vladimir Putin would like to recreate. So that's development number one. Development number two, distinct, the learning process of the dissident movement and democratic oppositions in Central and Eastern Europe, led by figures like um, Václav Havel in this country, Adam Michnik, Bronisław Geremek in Poland, um, the democratic opposition in Hungary, um, with its new philosophy of political change what Adam Michnik called the new evolutionism, uh, in which change was to come about through social self-organization from below. So the, the strategy of Charter 77. Um, and what this meant was that when the possibility of change came from above in 1989, a democratic opposition was there in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, in Hungary, to seize the chance of a negotiated revolution. So what you got from Gorbachev in Moscow was not a green light. It was only an amber light. It was the democratic oppositions in Central Europe who turned that into a green light by simply driving straight through it. So that's development number two. Development number three, simultaneously and by chance, in Western Europe, you had an extraordinarily dynamic period of West European integration. Again, the role of a, the individual in history, a man called Jacques Delors, a name some of you will be familiar with, by far the most impressive president of the European Commission since the founding years of, of the European community, with his agenda of 1992, that is to say, the completion of the single market uh, by 1992. Uh, incidentally, supported very strongly by someone else you may have heard of called Margaret Thatcher. Uh, it was one of the few periods in which Britain actually played a rather constructive role in the history of European integration. Now, what this did was not only to give great dynamism to Western Europe itself. By the way, Delors himself thought very little about Eastern Europe. But it enormously enhanced the soft power of Western Europe, of the European community. So that when people in this country, and I remember it vividly, said in 1989, we want to be a normal country, right? What they meant was, we want to be something like West Germany or France or Britain. And that was because the 
Europe, Western Europe looked particularly attractive at that time. So in, in defiance of usual historical logic, um, one might almost say that 1992 was the cause of 1989. Um, I don't know, do, do some of you know the film When Harry Met Sally? Anyone know that film? Well, this is a great film from 1989. It has a famous scene um, when the lead American actress um, fakes an orgasm in a cafeteria. And uh, it's a magnificent performance on her part. And um, at the end of this extended but fake orgasm, an old lady in the audience, uh, in, in the other part of the cafeteria, um, when the waitress comes to take her order, says, I want what she's having. Uh, and in a sense, what Eastern Europe said in 1989 was, I want what she's having. I want what, what they're having in Western Europe. Film from 1989, go and watch it. The um, fourth development, separate again, was what was happening in the United States. The United States had been in deep crisis in the late 1970s. After Vietnam, after Watergate, the city of New York was nearly bankrupt. There was profound pessimism. But by the mid-1990s, under President Ronald Reagan, um, America looked very dynamic. It was just about beginning to invent the internet. Um, in, in Reagan's famous slogan, it was morning in America. And so the US too was looking very dynamic. And then you had this very unusual combination where Ronald Reagan was the ultimate cold warrior in his first term stoked up the arms race, persuaded the Soviet leadership they couldn't win the arms race, and then when Gorbachev arrives, turns on a dime, and in his second term, becomes the ultimate protagonist of detente and disarmament. And this unique combination, which has to do with, the, the again, the role of the individual in history, Ronald Reagan personally, plays a crucial role in the end of the Cold War. So what you have is these four quite separate streams of historical development, each of which with a component of historical luck and individual leadership, that magically converge in 1989 to enable what happened in this country starting on the 17th of November, 1989. But then, even then, when you look at the detail of the developments, for example, the fall of the Berlin Wall, that again was nothing inevitable. It started with a, a fumbling mistake by a member of the Politburo, Gunter Schabowski, who misinterpreted um, the official communique he had to read. It continued with some misreporting by West German television. Um, in the language of today, we would say fake news. Uh, West German television reported at 10.40 p.m., the gates in the Berlin Wall are open. At that point, they were not open. The wall was still shut. But because East Germans, East Berliners, believed that this was the case, because they believed West German television, they came in such numbers down to the Berlin Wall that the pressure became so enormous, and at about 11.30 p.m., a Stasi officer called Harald Jäger decided to open the gates in the Berlin Wall at the Bornholmer Strasse platform, and the rest is history. Nothing inevitable. Historical luck. Freedom is not a process. It's a struggle. But then what happens is that with time, particularly the 68ers and to some extent the 89ers, become persuaded that this is the way history is going. This is the future. Now, let me just say in passing, people often at this point say, Francis Fukuyama, hands up. How many people have read The End of History? Hands up. Ah. How many people have heard of the end of history? Well, that's quite a few. So everyone ascribes this great mistake of liberal triumphalism, of hubris, to Francis Fukuyama, 
This is quite wrong. First of all, Francis Fukuyama wasn't saying this was the end of history. He was making a quite specific point. Secondly, we weren't overconfident in the early 1990s. We had no idea whether the transition to democracy and a market economy would succeed. Uh, the joke at the time was, we know you can turn an aquarium into fish soup, but can you turn fish soup back into an aquarium? All the big projects, the transition to a market economy, the transition to democracy, the single market, the enlargement of EU and NATO, Schengen, which gives you guys freedom of movement inside the Schengen area. Um, none of those big projects had yet been achieved. All the work was still to be done. So we were not overconfident at that point. And of course, we had the wars in former Yugoslavia, five wars in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, let's not forget. The, the historiosophical mistake the illusions, the hubris, in my view, really sets in in the early to mid-2000s, at the point where everything seemed to have gone so well. Poland and Hungary were regarded by political scientists as consolidated democracies. The enlargement of the EU and of NATO had happened, including this country. The euro seemed to be going very well. We were going to get a uh, European constitution, and the icing on the cake, there was the orange revolution in Ukraine, which seemed to prove that democracy would continue to spread inexorably to the East, democracy in Europe. And I think it's at that moment that we fall prey to the hubris. Now, one of two of you are going to say at this point, okay, so what about 9-11? Wasn't that a great turning point in world history? You know, the interesting thing is, looking back, working on this book, looking at the last 50 years, actually, at the time we thought that was the beginning of a new era. In European history, I don't think it was. Looking back, it doesn't seem to me to be the great caesura in post-1989 history. It had one enormous impact. It changed the United States. And that's its real impact on us. It's through the way it changed the United States. It launched the United States on a decade of and more of foreign wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Many would say a decade and more of strategic distraction, while China quietly rose in the East, while the entire attention of the United States was focused on slaying the Islamist dragon. And that, of course, had an impact on us. But for me, the caesura, the beginning of what I call the downward turn, remember the upward turn begins in 1985 and then re reaches a moment of triumph in 1989. For me, the beginning of the downward turn is 2005, and it then reaches full force in 2008. So in 2005, let me remind you, the Constitutional Treaty is voted down in referendums in France and the Netherlands. Poland has its first Kaczynski government, the Kaczynski twins, 2005 to 2007. And in 2007, at the Munich Security Conference, Vladimir Putin declares war on the West. Go back and read that speech if you haven't read it. That's the moment at which Putin declares war on the West. And then from 2008 onwards, starting with the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and the annexation by Putin's Russia of two chunks of the sovereign territory of Georgia, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia, we have it in full force. The hubris of the United States in Iraq, believing that it is now the new Rome, the hyperpower, the center of a unipolar world, that it can transform Iraq by conquest into a Western democracy, 
by the way, informed by the example of what had happened in Eastern Europe, the hubris of cool Britannia under Tony Blair, the hubris of the belief that all the countries of East Central Europe were consolidated democracies, the hubris of believing that NATO enlargement could continue beyond East Central Europe to include even Ukraine and Georgia without a strong reaction from Putin's Russia, the rather fateful wording of the conclusions of NATO's Bucharest summit in 2008. The Americans said, we want a plan for Ukraine to join NATO. France and Germany said, not on your life. The compromise, a very bad compromise, was that in the communique it said, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of, the Na of NATO, but actually there were no concrete steps to make that happen. This was the worst of both worlds because it did nothing to enhance the security of Ukraine, but it massively increased the threat perception in Moscow. The hubris of the EU, believing at that time that it was a model for the whole of the world, and that model of going beyond sovereignty and regional integration would now be followed by much of the rest of the world. A book by Mark Leonard entitled Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. The hubris of a globalized, financialized capitalism which believed that free markets were in many ways a universal panacea, that we should have the opening of frontiers to the movement of capital, of people, um, and that global aggregate gains, global aggregate gains in prosperity, and there were many, hundreds of millions of people in China and India lifted out of poverty, would compensate for specific local losses in our own society and the hubris of believing that ultimately it's the economy stupid. A kind of vulgar Marxism which said if only we get the economy right, then all else will follow. And as you know, when you look at the phenomenon of populism in all our countries, one might almost say it's the culture stupid as much as it's the economy stupid. That's to say, what I call the inequality of attention and respect towards the poorer parts of our societies, rural, small town, um, was as important as economic inequality. And so from 2008 onwards, you have crisis after crisis. The financial crisis segues into the Eurozone crisis and the Great Recession. Viktor Orban comes to power in Hungary in 2010, let me remind you already, and starts already in 2010 demo demolishing democracy in that country. In 2014, you have the seizure of Crimea and the beginning of the war in Donbass. The Ukrainian war didn't start on the 24th of February, it started in 2014. In 2015, the populists come to power in Poland. 2015, the refugee crisis. 2016, Brexit, the election of Trump. COVID crisis, and all the way to the 24th of February 2022 and the beginning of the largest war in Europe since 1945. And suddenly we are again in a Europe which has both war again and walls again. Because let me remind you that one response to the refugee crisis was to build a lot of new walls on our frontiers. Uh, this was, as I say, Au fond, a product of the historiosophical mistake of hubris, but like the upward turn in the late 1980s, the downward turn is also a product of the confluence, the convergence of a number of quite distinct historical developments that happen to converge and are mutually reinforcing. A few quick examples. The Alternative für Deutschland, the AfD in Germany, starts as an anti-Euro party, but rarely scores its electoral success by turning itself into an anti-refugee, anti-migration party. Brexit. The day before the Brexit referendum, the Daily Mail, 
the most influential newspaper in Britain, runs an editorial in which it says, it points both to the Eurozone crisis and youth unemployment in Southern Europe and to the refugee crisis. So the refugee crisis and Eurozone crisis, quite separate developments, feed into Brexit. Brexiteers praise Trump, Trump praises Brexit. Um, Salvini and Le Pen admire Putin, Putin supports Salvini and Le Pen. The economic consequences of COVID and the Ukrainian war are, are mutually reinforcing and both of them contribute to the emergence on the 25th of September this year, of a government in Italy led by a post-neo-fascist, Giorgio Meloni. On the 24th of February, 2022, our continent, which as I reminded you, set out with the motto, never again, goes all the way back. On the very territory where between 1941 and 1944, the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS had waged a war of terror in Ukraine. Putin's army wages a war of terror. The very same cities, the same towns, the same villages, sometimes even the same people. A man called Boris Romanchenko, a Ukrainian who survived four Nazi concentration camps killed by a Russian missile in Kharkiv. Uh, a Russian missile lands near the site of the Babin Yar massacre. Half the Jewish population of Ukraine has had to leave the country. Uh, a, a wonderful Ukrainian journalist, Natalia Gumenyuk, reports that when she talked to old Ukrainians, men and women in the villages around Kiev, like Bucha and Erpin, which were occupied by the Russians, these old Ukrainians talked about the occupiers, the barbaric occupiers, as Nimtsi, Germans, because that's the word they had for barbaric occupiers. It was the Germans. So much for being after the war. And I would be inclined to argue that this war the 24th of February, 2022, is in some senses the end of both the post-wall period and in one sense at least of the post-war period. So first of all, the post-wall period. You could argue that the beginning of the end of the post-wall period is 2008 with the global financial crisis and Georgia. But the ultimate end of the illusions of the post-war period comes with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And at the same time, we come full circle. Because what is behind this invasion is the Russian empire striking back. That is to say, what might have happened in 1991, what nearly happened with the attempted putsch to overthrow Gorbachev in 1991 now happens in 2022. And it's very interesting that the very brutal Russian general, Sergei Sorovikin, the butcher of Aleppo, who now commands Russian forces, was actually a putschist. He was a participant in the putsch in August 1991. And uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, praising his appointment on uh, Telegram, wrote, I quote, Surovikin didn't have time to get all of his ammunition into his tank in August 1991. If he had, we'd been living in a totally different country, one ten times more powerful. So, there you have it. Don't take it from me, take it from Mr. Prigozhin. They're doing now what the putschists wanted to do in 1991. We've come full circle. The post-war period is a bit more complicated. On the one hand, 
if you think about the state system in Europe, then the post-war, post-1945 period comes to an end in 1991. We have a new state system, we have a new treaty framework. If you think about the institutions, the key institutions of our time, then we are still in the post-war period. If you think about it, I mean, the European Union, which emerges from the European Economic Community, the Council of Europe, NATO, uh, the Bretton Woods Institution, IMF, World Bank, even the UN, all of them actually date from the post-1945 period. But in the sense which I identified at the beginning, after war, the belief that we can really lastingly move to a Europe um, which has put war behind it for good, this is surely the end of that period. And that is what, of course, Chancellor Olaf Scholz was meaning when he talked about Zeitenwende. And I don't need to tell this audience that Germany taking military power seriously again on its own behalf is a significant moment in European history. So now we move into a new period which does not yet have a name and whose character we don't know. Post, post war, post, post cold war, post, post wall, we don't know. And at that point, a historian should really shut up, because that's all we know, is what's happened. But I'm not going to shut up quite yet, because I just want to say a few words about how, and this is really to lead into our discussion about how we think about this period. And, and here I'm coming back to you, the students. How do we go at such a challenging, difficult uh, period, an unknown, dangerous period, and the formula I want to commend to you is the one that was actually coined by Romain Roland, but popularized but by Antoni Gramsci. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So you may find it odd to have pessimism recommended to you, but intellectual pessimism can be actually quite constructive. It was precisely because people were intellectually pessimistic in the late 1970s, that they recognized how profound was the crisis of Western democratic capitalism, that we got to the most hopeful period in European history, the upward turn, because they recognized how deep was the crisis we were in and proposed radical reforms. It was precisely the ill-founded historical um, intellectual optimism of the early 2000s that led us into the crisis. So intellectual pessimism, understanding how deep is the crisis we face. Having said that, I want to argue that the crisis, the reasons for intellectual pessimism are above all now external to the European Union. The European Union has actually survived all these crises quite well, most of the achievements of that great period of historical, of, 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 of historical progress from 1985 to the mid-2000s are still there. The fact that you, as citizens of the EU, can decide on a Friday morning that you want to jump in a budget flight and fly to Lisbon or Tallinn or Athens and spend the weekend there and if you meet someone you like, or just like the place, settle down there, study, work, live there, that achievement is still in place. We've got closer to a Europe whole and free in that sense than we ever have been before. And indeed, I think, out of this crisis in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, potentially comes a great opportunity. The opportunity that Chancellor Olaf Scholz talked about actually at this university at the end of August. I don't know if some of you were there for his speech. Maybe you weren't allowed in. But um, the opportunity actually to spread the boundaries of Europe, Poland, free, 
uh, to get serious about the agenda of enlargement, and we can talk about this, I hope, in the discussion, not just to the Western Balkans, but to Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, and the essential deepening of the European Union, which must come with that widening. That is a great opportunity. So in the European context, I see real reasons for cautious optimism. But the external context, the global context, is dramatically less favorable than it was in the 1980s or 1990s. We have a United States where not just the future of a particular administration, but the future of democracy itself is seriously questioned. We cannot count on the United States as we could for most of the post-1945 period. We have a neo-totalitarian China which is now eyeing Taiwan as Vladimir Putin eyed Crimea. We have Russia, which we talked about already. We discover that even though countries like India, South Africa, and Brazil are democracies, that does not necessarily mean they will line up with the West. In the Ukraine crisis, they pretty much lined up with Russia rather than with the West. Why? Well, there are many reasons for that, but one of them is it's payback time for 600 years of European colonialism and 200 years of Western supremacy. That's what the Indian and the South African and Brazilian reaction have in common. We have world population, which when I started traveling in Europe, continental Europe in the early 1970s was just 4 billion. It's just past 8 billion. Think about that doubled in 50 years. The huge demographic pressures that are gonna feed into pressures of mass migration to Europe. And then we have climate change, the great issue for many of your generation, and I hope we can talk about this. Um, just one data point. In the um, 50 years between 1972 and 2022, the planet warmed by 0.5 degrees, more than in the 11,000 years between the end of the last ice age and 1900. Just think about that. In 50 years, more than in 11,000 years. So I think you're absolutely right to identify this as one of the great challenges of our time. By the way, I'm here partly with a group of our students, a couple of them sitting in the front row, who did a great report, which I recommend to you, called Young Europeans Speak to EU, about what are the priorities for young Europeans. The thing they most value about Europe, freedom of movement, the biggest challenge, climate change. Uh, I'm very grateful to your climate strike committee for sending me an email uh, telling me about the climate strike here. Um, I'm great that you're carrying on the tradition of student activism. If I may say so, what I particularly liked about that was the focus on the university, what the university could do, not just what uh, corporations could do or governments can do, and on what we individually can do. Because change starts with us. When Václav Havel talked about living in truth, it wasn't just some abstract notion of an analytical academic truth. It was personally avouched, lived truth. It was the truth I bear witness to by going to prison as a political prisoner or by engaging in a demonstration uh, now or then. And this is where we come to the optimism of the will. I can tell you that I was frequently in Prague in the 1980s we had absolutely no idea that the change would come in 1989, that it would be peaceful, that it would be successful, that you would make a transition to democracy. And I have to tell you, we were just talking with Minister Beck, who was one of the student activists on the 17th of November. They didn't know what was gonna happen in the days after the Velvet Revolution. I got here on day four of the Velvet Revolution, immediately went to have a drink with Václav Havel, he didn't know what was going to happen. So, it, you know, from your perspective, those particularly younger who were not born then, 
It may seem as if this was some sort of inevitable development, but it was anything but. And that's a message of hope for you, which is that things may look very dark now and uncertain, but if you have this optimism of the will, things can change quite unexpectedly for the better. So let me finish my lecture with a quotation from Václav Havel, I think a very profound quotation, which is his way of saying pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, but in his, home, in his own terms. Uh, it comes from that long uh, interview he gave to Karalik Zdala, uh, translated into English as disturbing the peace. I quote, hope is not prognostication. It's not predicting the future. It's an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. Hope is an ability to work for something because it's good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out, like fighting for climate change, against climate change defending, improving, and extending a free Europe makes sense. It's a cause worthy of hope. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. And I thank, I thank you for this inspiring and positive talk. Now we have at least 30 minutes or more for your questions. So I'm opening Q&A and, I, and uh, please uh, talk into the microphone and introduce yourself before posing the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Esch, for this illuminating lecture and this panoramic overview. Uh, my name is Valeria Karablova. I'm Ukrainian, teaching at Charles University, so I thank you additionally for these rightly placed accents. That was nice to hear, but I want to go back to, to the illusions you mentioned in your lecture. So you said that we tended to perceive some historical contingency as a law, right? So we have to give up on the teleological teleological reading of history that it moves somewhere, it doesn't, right? So it's up to us. But I also want to say that probably it's time for us to get rid of a Eurocentric illusion. This post-colonial legacy is that we live at times of peripheralization of Europe, when uh, what we perceive as universal values are actually not. And it's not only about the market values, what Mark Leonardo calls the rise and fall of the Davos man, but also about the values of peace, dialogue, and negotiations. So I wonder what is your take, how Europe can reimagine itself in this non-Eurocentric world? And a more particular question, I remember several years ago you presented your project about this platform where different cultures have might have like find a common ground. So I wonder if it's still alive and you still believe in this uh, universal value of negotiation. Thank you. Listen, it's a, it's a terrific question. Um, I, 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 I think one way of formulating where we have to go strategically is to achieve a post-imperial Europe in two senses. The first is one crucial to your own country. Um, I, as I mentioned, even while Europe was construing itself as post-imperial in the 30 years after 1945, colonial powers were still fighting colonial wars. Thereafter, we still had an empire, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Russian Empire. And if we can consolidate the independence and freedom of Ukraine, of Georgia, of Moldova, then for the first time in European history, we will have on our continent a post-imperial Europe. Russia will cease to be an empire, right? And so we will, for the first time in centuries, not have empires either overseas or on land. So that's sense number one. But sense number two is the one you've just talked about. Can we 
think about ourselves through the eyes of others. So interestingly enough, in the second phase of our uh, Dandorf program project at Oxford University, the Europe Stories project, the first phase was the one I mentioned. It was how do we see ourselves, and in particular how do young Europeans see the European Union. So we were looking at ourselves from inside. In the current phase, in a project called Europe in a Changing World, we have reversed the gaze. And we have partnerships with universities in China, India, Turkey, Russia, and the US, pretty remarkable, um, to see how they see us. And so I think the starting point has to be not just in principle to think about this post-colonially, but in practice to go and listen to them and see how they see us. And I think this will lead us not to abandon our own values, but maybe to think slightly differently about the values we want to emphasize. So to give you one example, you know, if we'd been sitting here in 2007, most people would have been talking quite critically about sovereignty, right? They certainly wouldn't have identified sovereignty as a European value. Um, the European Union was about going beyond sovereignty, whereas Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin were very much talking about sovereignty. If we are to persuade India, South Africa, and Brazil, and other post-colonial democracies that they should be on the side of Ukraine against Vladimir Putin's aggression, it's probably not the best thing to keep talking all the time about democracy and human rights. But if you formulate it in terms of sovereignty, that has much more resonance with post-colonial countries. Um, so I think it's a very interesting challenge, and it, it, it would lead us not, I think, to, a, to, to abandon or even relativize our values, but perhaps to um, frame them in a somewhat different way. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I am Mateusz Hatcher. I'm currently studying European Studies here at the Faculty of Arts. I would like to ask you, how would you explain the continuous support of candidates and politicians that have a connection to the communist regime all those years ago, specifically here in the Czech Republic or uh, in the wider context of Eastern Europe, pro-Eastern candidates? Um, I can't imagine who you're thinking of. Um, <laughs> um, look, I, 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 I've worked quite a lot on this question of what you do about a difficult past. I, I actually had the interesting experience of reading my own Stasi file. I wrote a book called The File, which was all about how countries confront difficult pasts. So it looked at the history of uh, Lustratze and, and other ways of going about this. And I think there's one golden rule, which is judgment has to be individual, right? So Václav Havel's great objection to the law on lustration was not the idea of lustration in principle. It was that it passed judgment on whole categories of people, irrespective of their individual conduct. So if you're talking about General Pavel or whoever else you might be talking about, I think you need to look at the biography in detail. Yes, he did this course in military intelligence. What did he actually do? Did he actually harm people? How do you weigh that against what he's done in the th subsequent 30 plus years in building up the Czech armed forces and the relationship with NATO? And the same would be true with each other individual candidate. So I think that would be the essence of my answer. I don't think there should be no blanket judgments, no blanket disqualification, but also no brushing it under the carpet. Let's confront it. Let's, I think we have a right to know. There should be transparency. There should be full disclosure. And then the judgment has to be individual. Uh, my name is Olga Lomova. I'm from the Chinese department. Uh, well, I very much appreciated the overview of the uh, historical developments, uh, including the idea that uh, of hubris as something that very much uh, 
shaped certain things which we didn't anticipate before. What I found conspicuously missing in your talk was mention of universal values and human rights, yes, because this was a big topic for my generation growing up in 1970s, 1980s. It was a big topic of the Velvet Revolution, uh, and I still believe it's a, a very important moment after the Second War uh, when people across the globe could agree, representatives of different cultures, different states, could agree upon the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is not regarded to be a crucial document today by politicians, etc. So I would like to have your comment on the Universal Declaration. Thank you. So first of all, well, historically, you're, you're clearly correct, although it's important to remember that when the Helsinki Final Act was signed in 1975, it was fiercely criticized by many East European dissidents and by Alexander Solzhenitsyn as a sellout. And it was actually only the combination of East European dissidents, Charter 77 and others, and the administration of Jimmy Carter, which turned Helsinki, the Helsinki process, into a process which was centrally about human rights. Um, so that's also a, a contribution of, of the democratic opposition here. Um, and I would say, sort of coming to today, I mean, of course, everybody would agree with you about the centrality and importance of human rights, but um, I think that, first of all, there's a challenge that came from the first question, which is how universal was our universalism? You know, and, and the truth is that European universalism was anything but universal for much of its history. Uh, when it started, it only applied to a small group of privileged property, only white, white men. It didn't apply to women, it didn't apply to saves, it didn't apply to the poor. Um, uh, uh, and it certainly didn't apply for the rest of the world, who, was co who were colonized, right? Uh, and we've gradually made a progress towards a more universal universalism, which was actually the agenda of, of my work on free speech, was to move towards a more universal universalism. But let me give you one quick example. Um, we celebrate freedom of movement as this great European achievement. But our freedom of movement is brought at the cost of a lack of freedom of movement of people in the rest of the world. Talk to an Indian student or a Chinese student about how difficult it is to get a European visa. Talk to someone from Sub-Saharan Africa. Go as I have done to Ceuta, the Spanish enclave in Northern Africa, and look at the six meter high wall, which looks like Berlin Wall, which we're building to keep the migrants out. So we have to be try to be more consistent in our advocacy of universal human rights. And as I say, as I said in my first answer, we also have to think about formulating it in a way which is persuasive to the great swing states of the global south uh, on which the future will depend. One complementary yeah. question. Maybe I didn't express myself uh, correctly or clearly enough. I had on my mind the moment when people got together after the Second War and decided, were able to decide upon the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whether they were, I mean, the first, uh, the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was actually formulated by a Chinese diplomat. Yes, so they were Chinese, they were Arabic, they were African, uh, it was still colonial situation globally, yet at that moment there, there was under the shadow of the war, uh, people were ready to sign up for very simple, very basic things expressed in the Universal Declaration. So I wondered whether you perceived this moment as important for future development and whether something like that can come back. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, self-evidently, I do perceive that moment as important, but I, I think if you look at the world we're in, um, that hope that we had in the 1990s and 2000s, um, that, that our full agenda of human rights would simply be spread first across our continent and then around the world, um, looks illusory today. And that one of the hard judgments we have to make is, you know, if, 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 if for example, we think we need India as an ally to contain China uh, and prevent it uh, potentially starting an extremely dangerous armed conflict over Taiwan, um, how far are we prepared to compromise on our agenda of human rights in relationship with a country like India, or indeed with a country like Turkey. Where we shouldn't compromise is inside the European Union. So I think it's absolutely shameful how far we have allowed the erosion of democracy to proceed in Hungary inside the European Union. If anywhere we should be consistent in the universalism of our universalism, it's inside the European Union. My name is Doğan Berkercan. I am from Turkey. Uh, I am studying at Masaryk University, International Relations and European Politics. My question is, uh, you mentioned a lot of things about old colonies approach to Ukraine crisis, but you, uh, I think you didn't mention Tur Turkey's approach to Ukraine crisis. Is it still a natural country to Western allies or supportive to Russia? What do you think? Um, great question, connects directly to what I just said. Hard choices. Uh, um, Turkey is now a hard authoritarian regime, um, leading entirely peaceful civil society activists are now sitting in prisons for long prison terms, including a colleague and friend of ours, Hakan Altenay, who's sitting in a high security prison. Um, Erdogan is playing both sides brilliantly, um, um, NATO ally, but also in bed with Putin, making deals with Russia. Um, the, the Turkish economy greatly helped by the Ukrainian war. Look, we have to be realistic. This is the world we're in and we're gonna be in for some time when we're dealing with powers which really don't share our values, which are not un unambiguously on our side, but which we need, uh, I mean, for example, you know, the grain deal for exporting grain from, 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 from Ukraine was negotiated with Turkish help. So these are very simply the, the, the very difficult compromises we're gonna have to make. So to say once again, I, I, I don't think we should compromise on standards inside the European Union. I really don't. And uh, that means Turkey's candidate status is clearly very much on the back burner. But as a matter of real politic, we still have to deal with Turkey. Hi, um, I'm Rhiannon from the University of Oxford. Um, when you speak about your personal history, uh, visiting communist countries, you do speak with fondness, and it made me think of this concept of post-communist or post-authoritarian nostalgia, and I just wondered what your view is on current levels of nostalgia for these states and how this impacts our ability to learn from history and progress away from it if we are trying to progress actually away from it. Probably could you repeat your question? I'm sorry, the acoustic yeah. is... is, is um, I just wondered how you view current levels of post-communist and post-authoritarian nostalgia and how this impacts our ability to learn from history. Um, so, I, I, I think it is the real revolution in Central and Eastern Europe did not happen with the communist regimes. 
It happened with the transformation after 1989. Capitalism, capitalism was a much more revolutionary force than communism was. It, 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 much more, it changed everything. And so it's unsurprising that there was a reaction to it, which looked back either to the communist past as a time of relative safety and security, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us, or to the pre-communist past. So in a way, those two nostalgias, which seem completely different, are the product of a similar social psychology, uh, a reaching back to something which is more familiar. So I think that is unsurprising. <coughs> if that is the reason for it, then that the good news is it's a transitory phenomenon. It's a phenomenon of transition. And that is what in, I indeed believe to be the case. Uh, I, I, think, I think we are seeing, and, and, and actually a, a, a cautiously optimistic view of what's happening in East Central European politics is that we went through this phase of reaction, and now in some places, such as the Czech Republic, but also Slovakia, are actually coming out the other end. And in the case of Poland, if the next election goes against Law and Justice Party, again, you could see Poland, too, coming out the other end. So I think it is possible to see this as part of a longer transitional process. Um, my name is Viktor Pasisnichenko. Uh, I, I had to left my native Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, and now I'm doing the research in the, uh, here in the Institute of Philosophy. And first of all, it's a pleasure to see you in person because I've been tracing for your works and uh, always was finding something interesting. Uh, as well, I have found it in your, uh, in your provocative, uh, in terms of sorts, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, you've been speaking about the link between today and the events uh, of Velvet Revolution and 1991. Uh, in these terms, uh, don't you think that it's worth to consider that uh, the project of the Soviet Union didn't fail in, the, uh, in 1991, but is just failing right now in this war? because Russia was inherited, uh, and Putin, first of all, uh, has, uh, has inherited, in fact, the Soviet Union uh, legacy. And so now it looks like Ukraine uh, has played a dramatic and painful role um, by, by finishing uh, this uh, project of the Soviet Union. And if it's possible, the second question or remark. Uh, can we talk about the responsibility of the recent European elites? Uh, what, what I mean? It's well known that uh, Putin uh, is not serious in the relations uh, with uh, European elites. He, he is not considering uh, them as something uh, that, sh uh, that uh, he, had, uh, he has uh, to take uh, negotiation with, only with the United States. And is there some responsibility of the European elite that, uh, that he is uh, evaluating um, European leaders in, so, um, uh, in, su in such way? Maybe they are guilty for negotiating uh, Georgia uh, war and uh, uh, Ukrainian war when it started in 2014. Uh, when negotiations were done more in favor of Putin. And he was sure that he will take Ukraine in a few days and Europeans uh, will negotiate uh, as, as usually. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two connected questions. I hope people heard them at the back. Um, I think you're absolutely right in your observation with, with one side tweak. I, I think this is not about the Russian Empire more than it's about the Soviet Union. And if you look at Putin's writings and speeches, 
his reference point, I mean, I know he said the end of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, but actually his obsession is with the Russian Empire, with Catherine the Great, with Peter the Great, with Novorossiya, and so on. And so, as I hinted in my lecture, I think, you know, that you're absolutely right, that that is what we are seeing now. Um, there's a wonderful essay by a great German intellectual historian who some of you will have heard of called Reinhard Koselleck. Some of you heard Reinhard Koselleck. I re recommend his work to you, called The Unknown Future and the Art of Prognosis. And he makes a very simple point, which is if we're trying to learn lessons from history, um, the more you have recurrent patterns or recurrent events, the more likely you are to be able to learn from them. So for example, the statement, we shall all die, um, has a fairly high probability because there are not many examples to the contrary. Now, one of the recurrent patterns in history is that imperial powers don't give up their empires without a struggle, right? They fight back and um, the Brits should know this, the French should know this, the Portuguese should know this. And so the mistake we made was to think that in 1991, that was it. One of the, the largest land empire in Europe, which had grown over centuries, had softly and suddenly vanished away, and that was it, and that was the way it was going to be, right? And the coup was just something, that was just a sideshow, not a bit of it. Transnistria, 1992 already. The, the seizure of Transnistria in, in Moldova. And so this segues to your second point, which is the responsibility of European leaders. We were not wrong to try and help the modernization of Russia. I want to insist on that. It was not wrong. That was what we had promised Gorbachev, what we promised Yeltsin. It was a gamble worth taking, that by trying to assist the modernization of Russia, bring Russia into the G7, um, you know, uh, um, uh, have a NATO-Russia relationship, you could actually bring Russia into these structures of, 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 so to speak, liberal international order. The mistake was not to change our minds when the facts changed. And the facts start changing in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference, 2008 with Georgia, but I would say above all 2014. For me, 2014 is a turning point of which the West failed to turn. And I think our real culpability of, of, of European leadership comes in failing to adjust our policy fundamentally after 2014. The fact, which seems now incredible, that Germany negotiated and built Nord Stream 2 entirely after 2014, after this, that is incredible. So I think there is a, a real reckoning to be had about that failure and, you know, a lesson for the future, which is to try and learn the lessons of history where you can. Um, and now we have to ensure that this imperial strike back fails. We have to ensure that Ukraine wins. That's very clear to me, however long it takes. Uh, and that is, doors, opens the door to a post-imperial Europe. I like to say, you remember that um, uh, Dean Asherson, the U.S. Secretary of State, said of the British in the early 1960s that Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a role. And I like to say that Russia has lost an empire and not yet found a role. But the British example shows you that it can take some time. Professor Ash, uh, my name is Pavel Kulitek and I study at this faculty. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask about is, uh, do you think there is any uh, change in the quality of communication between the people that will be shaping how political events are evolving in the future? What, I'm, uh, what I mean is the social media and stuff. What, what we are seeing in the United States now is that uh, a lot of people believe something that we 
I think all know is a lie, you know, the, the rigged elections and all that. And they are, I think, kind of digging more into their own world. And recently I heard someone saying after the Fox News turned uh, their back to um, uh, Donald Trump that they were saying, well, it's because Soros uh, f secretly owns Fox News. And so there is explanation for everything, right? Uh, is this something, and my view, but of course, you know, my, my history is quite short. Uh, I don't really know if this is a fundamental change in how people perceive reality, uh, these kind of, um, I would say, um, uh, alternative truths, or uh, we can call it big lies that are taking kind of, uh, you know, ground in a significant part of the electorate. Is this something new, or you think that I've always existed in, in this way, and it's just a matter of the technique that is being used currently, which may be more social media and uh, other, other uh, types of disseminating information? Thank you. So, listen, it's an absolutely great question. Um, and, and it's the subject of a lot of incredibly simplistic statements. When people start generalizing about internet and social media, take a check on that, step back and look at the facts. So, democracy has an epistemic basis, all the way back to ancient Athens. And the epistemic basis of democracy is that all citizens come together in the same place, they are given the facts, they are given the competing arguments, and then they make up their minds. And this is how the ancient Athenians decided to fight the invading Persians at sea rather than on land, which is how they saved the, first, the world's first democracy. And what we see in the United States is that that epistemic basis is no longer given because different sets of citizens are meeting in two separate marketplaces. One set is meeting in the CNN, NPR, those liberal Facebook sites marketplace, and the other set of people is meeting in the Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, Talk Radio, those Facebook sites. And so they have not just different views but different facts and you now have hundreds of elected rep Republican representatives and millions of Republican voters who believe that Donald Trump actually won the 2020 election, which he didn't, by the way. Um, and that is a fundamental threat to democracy. But it's not an inevitable result of the internet and social media because this is not the case in Germany, for example. It's not the case in France. It's not the case in Britain. What's the lesson from that? Look at your own national information environment, your own national media landscape, and make sure that it still fulfills these basic conditions of democracy. And by the way, even in Europe, we don't really have a European public sphere. It's only an elite public sphere. Our, our, our public spheres are still basically national. So look at your own national information environment and see that it fulfills these conditions. I'd be very interested to know what you think in this room about the, the, the media landscape in the Czech Republic. My superficial observation is that you're in a significantly better place than Poland. Poland is a long way down the American road because state television in Poland is now a propaganda station for the ruling party. And then they have their own media, and then on the other hand you have TVN and Gazeta Wyborcza and Onet.pl, and so you have these two different marketplaces like in the US. I believe, but correct me if I'm wrong, that the situation is rather better here because you still have Czech public television, you still have uh, uh, public radio and so on. Hang on to it for dear life. Make sure it's independent and quadruple its budget. Hi, I would like to uh, ask I've heard a lot of um, opinions that if uh, Russia would somehow get rid of Putin or if he wouldn't have existed at all, then it would be solved. And I was always thinking that um, if there if it wasn't him, someone else would probably be there who would do the very same move. So what 
I want to ask is whether it's the leader, the Putin, that is shaping the public demand of Russia, or is it the opposite, that the public demand is shaping the leader? So this is post-Putin, yes? Post-Putin, right? I confess we didn't understand but well, please. You're asking about what comes after Putin, yes? Yeah. Is that what you... No, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's the acoustic, I... I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, the answer is obviously both. So if, if, if um, you know, if you ask, is this Putin's war or Russia's war? It's obviously both. That's self-evidently the case. Uh, and obviously he, he, has, he has shaped Russia in many ways. Um, but uh, um, I, there is a view which has been articulated, for example, in, in our project, our partner is the High School of Economics in Moscow, and we had a, a Zoom webinar where Fyodor Lukyanov, um, a leading Russian foreign policy analyst, was expressing the view that for decades to come, Russia was likely to orientate itself culturally towards the West, but geopolitically towards the East. So its long-term geopolitical partnerships would be with China, um, with authoritarian powers, but continually and culturally to orient itself to Europe, towards Europe and the West. If you talk to the people around Alexei Navalny, the very impressive people around Alexei Navalny, they would totally dispute this. And they would argue that they have significant evidence that that is not the case. And they believe that after a a really, really possibly even worse transitional period uh, after Putin, with you know the, some really hardline people coming in and very dangerous period, um, the politics of the country would actually come back towards somewhat more of a, of a Western slash European orientation, also because of the orientation of many of the elites, the business elites, um, also because of the orientation of younger generations who are much more oriented towards Europe and the West. So um, it's a very open question, obviously. Um, my inclination is to think that um, the Navalny people are more likely to be right and that longer term Russia is not going to be happy to see itself as a satrap, a junior partner of China, and that it will see its future in some special relationship with, um, with, 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 with Europe and the West. And if I may just add one word to that, in order to encourage that process in Russian society, and here our Ukrainian friends may marginally disagree with this, I think it's really important that we don't cut off ties with Russian students, Russian academics, Russian intellectuals, Russian journalists, Russian society. Um, if, 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 if Russian students and young people feel we're punishing all of them, we're blaming them for Putin's war, they may actually become more nationalist in their reactions. So for example, in our project, we came under pressure to cut off ties with our uh, Russian academic partner, partner, we absolutely, with my colleague Hartmut Meyer here and others, we absolutely resisted those. And I can tell you on those Zoom webinars, the Russian students are so grateful that we're still talking to them, even if we're engaging very critically. Um, so I hope for you too that's a message. I think we have to keep engaging with Russian civil society, with, particularly with younger Russians, to make sure that it goes this way and not the other. So. Now we have uh, time for last two questions for Michal Pullman. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for your fabulous talk. My name is Michal Pullman, I'm a historian and, I'm, and I totally agree with the very fact that we historians have to be extremely cautious in interpreting contemporary world because we tend to, inter we t we tend to explain that with, uh, with the past and with, with, uh, with sometimes perhaps ob obsolete notions. What I wanted to address is the Russian society that seemed to approve quite heavily not only dictatorship but also these imperial notions, what you were, you, what you were t t t talking about. Uh, the reaction of the European 
European publics is an outrage, is, an, is a kind of bitterness about the very fact that the Russian uh, allegedly do not understand the universal human rights, which is then surprising for me, because we, I mean, uh, it's not only in the Czech public sphere, I'm reading also the German one, and I'm quite struck by the fact that even historians do not uh, remind uh, that, I mean, to be a critical intellectual in the last two centuries in Moscow, under Samadjarjavie, under Stalinism was really very different from being a critical intellectual in London, Frankfurt and Paris. And it's no, it's nothing surprising on the very fact that the Russians do not approve, let's say, the European notion of the universal the human right at the same time. Russian society is not monolithic, is not totalitarian. Do you see some root of, let's say, discontent, some kind of possibility, some kind of hope of Russian um, enlightenment? Thank you. Um, thank you for an excellent question. Two comments on that. First of all, isn't it fascinating how much we in Europe are now talking about empire? and imperialism and post-imperialism and post-colonialism. You know, it, 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 it's almost a paradox that in the period when there still were European empires, we didn't talk about it half so much. And um, you know, in European debates and discourse in the 1990s and early 2000s, it hardly featured. And this is, by the way, partly an thanks to an achievement of your generation looking to the students at the back because you came back to us and confronted us, I mean the Brits and the French, with the fact that we hadn't faced up to our imperial past. I mean, we were talking about people not facing up to the communist past, but we have a colonial past which we really haven't faced up to. So we had the Roads Must Fall movement in, 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 in Oxford. Um, what, what I want to say with this is I think the imperial component in Russian thinking, in Russian consciousness, is just overwhelmingly important, overwhelmingly important. And, uh, and actually it's even more difficult for the Russians than for the Brits because uh, um, in England, we have one of the oldest continuous histories of a nation state before empire. So after empire, we have something to go back to, right? There was an English parliament, there was an English monarchy, there were English courts in the 14th and 15th centuries. So we have this thing to go back to. Russia doesn't have that pre-existing national state, right? There was Muscovy and then there was empire. So I think it's particularly difficult in the Russian case. Is there ground for hope? Um, I sort of hinted at it in my last answer. I think, you know, if you talk to Russian students, you get a very different feeling. The truth is, we don't know what Russians think because we can't believe state media, but we also can't believe the opinion polls. Uh, it's very interesting detail on the Russian opinion polls. Um, w w what you can see on the online polling is how many people how many, what percentage of respondents didn't answer a particular question? And on questions on the war in Ukraine, you know, it's 70, 80, 90% of people didn't answer the question because they were frightened to answer it or didn't want to. So we literally don't know what they think. And you know what? They don't know what they think either. Because one thing happens with, when you're under dictatorship in a war is you're caught up in the atmosphere and the fear and the anger, the emotions. So actually, I think it's after the war and after Putin that we will find out, but they themselves will find out what they really think and what they really value. And I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a message of hope. Uh, my name is Martin Jeřábek, Faculty of Social Science. 
Professor Ash, thank you very much for your brilliant comments and your lecture. I would like to have one, only one question because I got a book, your book from Peter Katzenstein, a professor at the Cornell University. In Europe's name, it was your book, it was 20 years ago. And uh, I would like to ask about the role of Germany because I think we are talking about China, Russia, European Union. You mentioned also Germany. On one hand, the question if Germany should take the responsibility as the very successful economy in, the, in Europe. On the other hand, if Germany will take this responsibility or there would be a danger that Germany should be or would be or would like to be too dominant and it could cause a fear of the neighborhood countries uh, as it was in the history. Thank you very much and thank you for all your comments. Um, thank you very much. Poor old Germany, of course, people object when it's doing too much and they object when it's doing too much. They object when it's calling the shots and when it's not calling the shots. Um, Germany is Europe's central power. Die Zentralmacht Europas, book title of Hans-Peter Schwarz. It's simply a fact. Uh, and, and not just yesterday. I mean, over many decades and even centuries, you know, one can think about the European question as the question of, of, of Germany and Europe. So it obviously matters enormously what Germany's strategy is. And um, I see in the evolution of Olaf Scholz some signs of real hope. Three days before the 24th of February this year, a key advisor to Olaf Scholz told me, Olaf's position on EU enlargement is absolutely clear. Western Balkans are no further. That's it. Four months later, he's standing in Kiev with Macron and Draghi, saying, we welcome Ukraine as a candidate for EU membership. Six months later, he's standing at the Charles University in Prague, and not just repeating that commitment, but also actually sort of beginning to spell out in what I regard as a very good speech, some sense of what that will involve. And so if Germany sticks to the basic strategic lines of the vision that was began to be laid out by, by Scholz in his Prague speech, I think that's a great hope for Europe because it's going to be a hugely demanding, multi-year, multi-decade task to achieve that second big Eastern enlargement, including both the Western Balkans and Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. Um, huge sums involved economically, big changes for the European Union, and of course he's absolutely right to emphasize that you can't do the further widening without the deepening. And so you do need an extension of qualified majority voting and so on. And I believe that we, all of us, but particularly the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, would be very well advised to engage deeply with Germany in a supportive spirit, but also to make sure that it doesn't make some of the mistakes that Germany has made in the past uh, in, that, in pursuing that strategic agenda. So that I think the current Polish government could not be more mistaken, because that may be one of the things you're referring to, in now launching this huge anti-German campaign. I mean, night after night, anti-German propaganda on Polish state television the demand for trillion euro reparations from Germany, absolutely the wrong thing. I would argue that's not just an anti-German uh, campaign, it's an anti-Ukrainian campaign and an anti-Polish campaign. Because if your priority really is to help Ukraine win not just the war but the peace, you need your Germany more than ever. So you need to keep Germany on side. Um, so, so I think, I think my answer to you is very clear. Germany is beginning to sketch out a strategic future, which is one that would be very good, particularly for Central and Eastern Europe. It should be in, supported and encouraged down that road and warmly embraced. Professor.
Professor, to conclude, uh, I would mention one statement you made in uh, one of your public public lectures. Sorry, they you, didn't. <laughs> you, you called yourself Isaiah Berliner. You said, ich bin ein Isaiah Berliner. You probably wanted to find a link, direct link between democracy and liberalism. Do you think could democracy survive without liberalism? Liberal, illiberal democracy is like fried snowballs. It's a contradiction in terms. Democracy long term is liberal or it's no longer democracy. Uh, so the term illiberal democracy for me is useful to describe a liberal democracy in a state of decay, which is what Poland is. Hungary, by the way, is no longer an illiberal democracy. It's no longer a democracy. It's an elective, uh, electoral authoritarian regime, a hybrid regime. Um, so absolutely, uh, democracy and, 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 and liberalism have to go hand in hand. Uh, and of course, one of the things that's dangerous about populism is that it counterposes dem democracy to liberalism. It says we are the true Democrats against the liberal elites. Isaiah Berlin, however, who I had the great privilege to know, I don't know if many of you have read Isaiah Berlin. If you haven't, go off and, and read some Isaiah Berlin because you'll, you'll do yourselves a treat. Um, but his great theme was actually not liberalism and democracy. His great theme was liberalism and pluralism. How do you combine a, a, a free society, a liberal constitutional democracy, with extremely diverse societies where people come from different cultures, have different religions, have very different values, Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, and um, for me, that's the great Ich bin ein Berliner challenge, a uh, uh, message of our time, which is, can we def c combine liberalism and pluralism? And uh, that's a challenge that you know, we're facing in West European societies, in Germany and France and Britain, but I think the Czech Republic and Central Europe will be facing, facing soon enough. So um, maybe you'd like to be Berliners too. So once more, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. Thank the audience uh, for, for questions and I hope there will be opportunity to meet again soon at Faculty of Arts. Thank you very much and have a nice day.